And then we figure that not messengers. You know, I mean, they're the only ones who are weird enough and crazy enough to piece it together and realize it's not a serial killer, it's a fucking vampire. Um, but then they were also, and again, remember the generation ago, this was pre-cell phones. I mean, you had a beeper. You know, we used pay phones. Um, there was no internet. But we were networked together, you know, and the, a messenger service, you know, you have a dispatcher who keeps track of where all the messengers are throughout the city, and then everybody's got a beeper, and there's pay phones all over the place, and you just keep calling in calling in. And so, you know, it almost becomes like a military base of operations for a vampire hunt. Um, and that was great. So it ended up being punk vampire in the subways of Manhattan being hunted by street messengers. And that, that worked for us. You know, and we're also pulling from real life. I mean, a lot of the characters were, you know, there was nobody who was like actually plucked from real life and stuck in the book, but a lot of people that we knew were composited into the colorful, eccentric band of weirdos that end up hunting Rudy Pascoe. But what, um, about Rudy? Hmm? But what about Rudy? Uh, we met a lot, you know, I knew a lot of people like Rudy. You know, I mean, uh, he was largely a construct, but I mean, it was, it was a certain archetype of person that, uh, you know, it was very true then. It's just as true today. You know, I mean, you know, early 20s, you know, she, you know, talent but ego and attitude and hates the entire fucking world, you know, and, you know, general, you know, good looking, you know, kind of bad boy who treats his woman like shit. I mean, you know, you can, you can walk out the street in any major city or, and throw a rock and hit 50 guys like that, you know, today. Um, so... He became, and part of the thing was also, I mean, part of my thinking, and I think John and I, even though John and I really always were and still are very, very different people, you know, for the very first time we met each other in high school, we were two weirdos who came from completely different directions and kind of landed on the same ground, you know, and we kind of shared this weird mutant vision of the world. And one of the things that I know I love to do was upend any kind of myth you know, just kind of literally turn it upside down and kick the living shit out of it, you know, just to see what comes out. But then one of my favorite vampire movies, when I was a kid, um, and, you know, I was a kid in the 60s, and we didn't have helicopter parents and playdates, you know, I mean, your parents would just say, you know, here, go to the movies, you know, just, you know, be back for dinner, just leave me alone. And I went to see, what was it, Roman Polanski's The Fearless Vampire Killers, um, when I was eight. <laughs> and... I was amazed, you know, and I went to see it all by myself. And I was just amazed because I'd never seen, and I was always into horror movies. I mean, I was, when I was three years old, I was drawing pictures of skeletons with blood, you know. Um, and when I grew, I grew up and I was watching, you know, on, you know, a black and white TV with, you change the channel with a pair of pliers, you know. I watched Chiller Theater and the original Outer Limits and Twilight Zone. And then when I was a little bit older, uh, you know, what was it, Night Gallery. You know, and I always loved horror movies, but when I saw this horror movie, when I was about eight, it's like it turned my entire concept of vampires and horror movies on the head, because it, it was the movie that Roman Polanski wrote, directed, starred in, and also the movie that he met Sharon Tate, who he married. Um, but he played the young, uh, you know, the young student of the vampire hunter, um, and there was this one great scene, um, it was this mixture of horror and comedy, you know, which I loved, and there was this one great scene um, where they're staying in this inn in the old country, and it's a pair of Jewish innkeepers, a husband and wife, and the one uh, innkeeper, he gets bitten by the Count and becomes a vampire, and he's menacing young Roman Polanski, who reaches down and holds up a cross, you know, in front of him, and he's like, trying to fend off the man, and he holds up the cross in front of this vampire, and the vampire starts laughing, and he's like, Oi! Do you have the wrong vampire? <laughs> you know, and they attacks him, and I just, I lost it. You know, I mean, half of my family's Jewish. I grew up in a mixed ecumenical household. Um, and I just thought that was one of the funniest things I'd ever seen at the age of eight. So, you know, then at the age of 22, you know, I wanted to, I know I wanted to write a vampire story that I wanted to see, that I wanted to read. Um, but I also wanted to break all of the rules of vampires. Um, and so to me, the idea was, um, Rudy Pascoe is, he's a babe abandoned on the doorstep of hell. 
by this ancient, you know, 800 year old ancient one entity who, you know, just kills an entire subway full of people just for laughs one night while he's visiting the new world. And he just plants Rudy as a seed in the darkness because he, he sees something in him and he just leaves him there. But, you know, for me, what was fascinating about it was here's a vampire who wakes up and he is a vampire, but he hasn't automatically become aristocracy. And the only thing he really knows about vampires is what he's seen in bad vampire movies. So he doesn't even know what his powers are. And he's also a guy who in real life was a dick. I mean, he was really an asshole, but in undeath, kind of finds himself. You know, as, as he starts to, you know, gain some semblance of control over his powers, you know, it's like his id and his super ego just like, and he's like, wow, you know, this is what I want to be. And I just, I love the idea of upending convention. You know, and I think that's, that's the thing that John and I shared, <coughs> certainly in the light end, but um, throughout our partnership. We were very good at upending conventions. And, and yet, being willfully transgressive and having and yet fun. You with have it. Hack Dorian. Hmm? And yet you have oh, Hack Dorian. Hack Dorian. Which is such yeah. a, an homage to Van Helsing. Yeah, well, I, mean, yeah. I saw that and I was like, really? Yeah, Who yeah. But, you know, he's an homage to uh, Armand Hack Dorian, is an homage to a Van Helsing character because you kind of need one of those in a vampire story. But he's also, you know, his personal story is he's, he's from the old country and. He wasn't Jewish, but he got sucked up in the concentration camps anyway. You know, because a lot of people in concentration camps above and beyond Jews, you know, political prisoners, etc. And so he, he is a Van Helsing character who's now kind of a homeless guy who has seen the face of evil. Um, he's literally seen it before in his life. And metaphorically, he's seen it from Nazi Germany, but he's also seen, there's one actual sequence in the book where you know he has this vision of seeing uh and it was it was really i've studied a lot about world war ii i'm actually going to germany in a couple months to um do uh for a bunch of different reasons but also there's a project i've wanted to write for about 25 years and i have to go to the death camps um and i have to see where they were and i have to see where they're not anymore um but i've studied that period of history a lot and uh, the whole thing of, um, I mean, Armand Hectorian's backstory was also based on the, uh, on the story of Treblinka, which was one of the pure death camps. It wasn't a, a slave labor camp. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything but, and it was designed and constructed to be a human being disposal factory. But it was also one of the few camps that the prisoners actually overthrew, historically. And I thought that was important. Um, for a lot of different reasons, but in the context of this story, to show that you can actually defeat evil. Um, and I guess the other thing about, uh, that I always felt about The Light at the End, and that I felt about vampires in general, I mean, I love vampire movies and everything, but I mean, uh, these aren't Twilight vampires. You know, these aren't True Blood vampires. These are not, you know, fun, nice, sexy vampires. I mean, this is a portrait of vampirism as almost like a, a ruthless, virulent addiction. And I always thought, if I really sat down and thought about vampires, I'm like, well, they're really, they're fuckers, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, these are, uh, you know, these are not people you'd want to invite to your party. Um, they use and they consume human beings. And so I always intrinsically thought, you know, I always wanted to write a vampire story in which the vampires are actually the bad guys. And the good guys, the heroes, are the human beings who are trying to stop them. Which kind of rubbed up against all <coughs> traditional vampire lore. Uh, you know, vampires are evil, yes, but they're kind of sexy. I mean, vampirism uh, really... Be, I mean, 20th century vampirism in, in fiction and in, in literature and even in film was kind of uh, what, like a, an Edwardian, Victorian metaphor for repressed sexuality. You know, so makes sense, you know. Uh, but at the same time, that doesn't change the fact of what they're doing. And I just like the idea of violating convention. Um, because it's just, it's, it's fun and it's interesting. And we wanted to write something really 
really scary. And I think we did that. You don't have to say your word. Go ahead and cry, baby.